Please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Alan. I apologise for starting late. You may. Oh, I need the microphone up, don't I? I have mic we have some uh, technical problems. <laughs> We've been saved. <laughs> the um, Bluetooth, yeah. wooden Bluetooth. Um, so, yeah, so I, I write books, and one day maybe I'll write a book that actually sells. And like J.K. Rowling, <laughs> I can kick back and relax. Um, but until that time comes, I'll keep giving them away. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, this is the URL. You've all got your phones. If you go over there and register, at the end, I will draw a winner. I'll put the names in. In fact, what I might, what I'll probably end up doing is during the lightning talks, I'll draw the winner. So register now, and I'll draw a winner. And you can have a look. It's a signed copy. <laughs> the bad news is, I was reviewing the copy edits on the train down in the second edition. The, the problem is with digital books is you're never done. I know this one's printed, but it's really a digital book. Um, so. Um, it was great to see Jeff's talk this morning, and nothing I'm about to say is incompatible with what Jeff was saying. In fact, an awful lot of what Jeff was saying this morning, I, I, was, I would say, in fact, I said it several years ago, just, just a bit late to the party. Um, no, so I, for me, they kind of fit together. He's just perhaps emphasising about different aspects of the process, but it's all the same big thing, yeah? And we'll, you'll start to see why that is in a moment. So before we get in... Audience participation time! Yeah. yeah, the exit's blocked, you can't leave now. So, hands up if you have a backlog. Okay? Keep them up if you expect your backlog to be done this quarter, in the next three months. One, two, three, two, five, six. Oh, they're all on this side of the room. Three of us are the same company. Ah! <laughs> okay, so of those of you, the few of you, the elite who have their hands, oh, the rest of you, the rest of you are like, um, who expects your backlog to be done this year? Okay, so there's another half dozen, you all work for the same company. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, but doing a backlog, getting a backlog zero is success, isn't it? That's what it says in the scrum books. You know, aren't you supposed to get to the end? Do all the backlog? Yeah? That's what people want to know. When will it be done? When will the backlog be empty? Um, so, who in the room can tell me, and shout out if you know the number, what's your team velocity? With like story points, hours, backlog items, what is your team's velocity? 55. 55? It's four currently. Four? Okay. Both good numbers? <laughs> 75, 75. 45 with another. Okay, right, so th this is Agile Basics. If, if you were doing any kind of capacity management, uh, story pointing, burn down chart, any kind of estimation, you need to know what your velocity is. However you manage it, whether you call it velocity or not, if you don't know that number, you haven't got a chance in hell. Okay? So, can anyone tell me it's, par it's partner number. Um, what's your backlog growth rate a month? <laughs> yeah? Go on, you need to know how fast you're going, and you need to know how fast the target is moving. So years ago, I worked with a large airline, because they only large airlines. You don't really get small airlines. And uh, they were doing about 100 story points a month, which sounds quite good, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Big team, big team. Uh, but I calculated this was 7% of the backlog a month, which is quite good. You know, you, you always want it sooner, but you, know, you could be talking, you know, a year, 14 months, could be done. Except I also calculated that the growth rate was 7.5% a month. So some of you may recognize this situation. It's called an underwater mortgage. It's where the payments you're making aren't even covering the interest on your mortgage. And there's a lot more of you in the room in that situation than there were 12 months ago. Just aren't we glad George Osborne brought the debt down? Yeah? Um, so, backlogs. This is what they're supposed to do, isn't it? Yeah? 
And there are even tools on the market which draw a 45 degree line on there <laughs> for you to feel guilty about not making. Has anyone ever met that 45 degree line? No. no. You said you haven't got, but you all feel guilty about not meeting it. Yeah? Uh, whose backlog looks like this? No. Is this a more common band? <laughs> yes. Yeah, they, they, may, they may go down for periods, but overall the trend is up, which is a bit of a problem if your organization expects you to be done one. Ooh, well, that wasn't my machine, I don't think. Okay. Um, so it's a problem if you're expected to be done. But actually, this is a sign of success. This shows that people want you to do something. This shows that, that you're delivering benefits. And when people come back with requests, if nobody's using your product, if no one's interested in what you're doing, it ain't going to go up because no one's interested. But that Excel creates problems. Um, spoiler alert, by the way. Now we set the scene. Um, the title of the presentation is Honey, I Shrunk the Backlog which I think is cool, and I know there are other people who feel cool, and some of you don't know the film. Some of you are too young to remember the film, <laughs> right? So, spoiler, I'm not actually going to shrink the backlog. That's a lie. I want you to nuke the backlog. I want you to take it out and destroy it. You only have your burn down charts to lose, right? So, yeah, get the photos in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, tweet these out. Get it out there, folks. <laughs> Nothing to lose but your burn down charts. So, um, we should fix global warming. We should feed the world. We should create world peace. And we should do all the backlog, right? But the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Today, our backlogs are like my children's cuddly toys or comfort blankets, if your kids prefer comfort blankets. They're what psychologists call transient objects. So parents, you know, when your kids go to nursery and they start going to, they, they, they want one of these toys to hug because mum and dad aren't there and it's scary leaving at home without them. And, and the, these toys serve to allow children to move into new things and do things they haven't done before. Because by taking Baby Yotta with you, you're taking a bit of home, you're taking a bit of mum and dad, right? They help you move from one world to another world, transient objects. And that's what backlogs are. Backlogs have helped us move from the big, old, big requirements document world to where we are now. But if we are to go forward with this thing we call Agile, we need to let go of them. The time has come to leave our childish things behind. Because while you're not doing this, you have a problem. Any, any product owners, product managers, BAs in the room? Yeah, yeah. So people come to you and they say, I've got a great idea for your product. Yeah. And, oh, and you say, oh, let me write that down. In the old days, we wrote on a card. Now you power up Jira and type it in. Yeah. So you take it in and you say, yeah, thanks, I've had it to the backlog. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, they think they're going to get it, and you're thinking. <laughs> but you know what? It's a damn sight easier to accept it and put it in the backlog than it is to say, no, or thank you, it's a brilliant idea, but it doesn't really fit in with the strategy. You know, it doesn't make our cost-benefit criteria. It's going to complicate our user interface. Rather, just let it go. Because adding it to the backlog costs you just about zero. But saying no is immediately going to be a long conversation. And heaven forbid, when you say no, they go to their boss and they say, they won't let us have it in the bag. And their boss goes to your boss and you get called in and you oh, frick it. Just say yes and put it in. <laughs> but a few months later, the conversation resumes. And they think they're going to get it. And of course you say, we've been busy. Priorities, you know. <laughs> if he hadn't got to the top in the last six months, it ain't going to get there. <laughs> Somebody was telling me last night, they, they tried to sort some of their backlog out. And there's this question mark about things that have been in the backlog before COVID. Because, you know, it would have given... That's a different world! <laughs> you do not live in a pre-pandemic. The world ended. 
<laughs> it was an idea before the pandemic, and you haven't done it. Start all over. Yeah, problem is you're degrading trust. They've now asked you for things, and you've not done it. And we pride openness and honesty, and we build on trust. But every time you put something in the backlog, and you kind of know it isn't going to get done, and six months later it isn't done, you're degrading trust. Now, you could go to them and say, that thing you asked for, it ain't never got, that's going to degrade trust some more. You know? So we've got a trust problem here. If we don't deal with this thing, we're going to degrade trust and our future. So our problem is not having backlog items. You know? Our problem is delivering the backlog. And our problem is meeting backlog expectations. Certainly doing all the backlog would meet some expectations, but it ain't going to happen anytime soon. We've got to find an alternative way of managing the backlog. And by the way, every time I say backlog, I really mean product backlog. See, our problem is backlogs don't scale. Managing a backlog of 10 items and a backlog of 100 items, let alone 1,000 items, are completely different problems. <laughs> it's, my machine's never done this before. It's not my adapter here, but I assume we've used this adapter with other people. Um, maybe it's... OK, anyway, so um, backlog. So, when I talk about backlogs, I don't mean sprint backlogs. I don't mean backlogs in the small. I mean backlogs in the big. Your product backlogs, which are measured in hundreds of items, backlogs which aren't going to get done for months or even years. Um, having little backlogs for the next sprint or the next couple of sprints, OK, that works in the small. Backlogs for your team works in the small. But big backlogs that are going to be months and years into the future, trying to coordinate two teams who've both got a backlog of 500 items. Well, if we do one of your 500 and one of your 500, I'll do one of my... And trying to coordinate a backlog, it doesn't work. It's trivia. When we scale up, we've got to find another solution. So, um, now the clicker isn't working. <laughs> Uh, it's when I was setting up, I was saying, you know, these 99 times out of 100, these things just work. And the one time it doesn't work, you look like a fool. Uh, this seems to be working and then not working. Uh, uh, but right now, uh, yeah, so we end up with a woods for the trees problem. You can't see what you're trying to do because you've got so many items. Uh, and you end, you end up with, no, just, <laughs> no. You, you, you end up with a bottomless pit where you just keep putting stuff in and keep putting stuff in, keep putting stuff in. And let's see. Gone. Yes. And the problem's actually getting worse because we, have, we keep having great new ideas. So something Jeff mentioned this morning, discovery. The idea that we can do discovery, we can, we can, we can build something. And we can send it out with our product manager and show it to customers. Do you like this? Is it shiny enough for you? Will you use this? Will you pay for this? And then they come back and say, customers want something else in it. You know, in the olden days where we tried to lock everything down, an exchange request would be seen as a black mark. I've had BAs tell me that, that their company, if there's a change request after the requirement was signed off, is seen as a black mark on the BA. And they talk about it at their performance reviews. How did you miss that feature Fred wanted? You know, um, but now we encourage this. We get into this discovery situation where we're delivering, we're de de delivering stuff, we're getting feedback, we're showing the customer coming back. How are you ever going to do a backlog when you're letting customers have a voice? <laughs> and the other technique, which you know, the, the book alludes I'm involved with, is, is OKRs, objectives and key results, which again Jeff mentioned this morning. If you're using OKRs and, key, and Agile, the question you have to answer is, which comes first? Mm -hmm. Do you write OKRs to describe the backlog you're going to do in the next three months? Or do you write OKRs which dictate which backlog items you're going to do in the next three months? And if you write an OKR, that in a month in, you find it need to do an item which is not in the backlog, are you going to say, no, I can't do that? Or are you going to create it? And if you're going to create it, then how do you know what you're <laughs> 
So the problem I faced, um, I was working with some teams using OKRs and the year before the pandemic. And we faced this, you know, how do you relate backlogs and OKRs? And me and one of the coaches on the other team, we had this discussion. I remember we were sitting in a coffee shop in, in the office. And um, she said, we are writing our OKRs to reflect the backlog items we intend to do in the next three months, which is great. Can you tell me backlog items you're going to do in 10 weeks' time? Some teams can. So if you're going to write an OKR to describe the backlog you're going to do over the next three months, you have to be fairly sure of what you're going to be doing in the next three months. And then you need to reverse engineer an OKR, which describes in general terms the backlog you're going to do, because you don't want to list all the backlog items. So she was doing it that way. And I decided I was going to sideline the backlog. We're going to write OKRs. And we're going to use the OKRs to either select items from our backlog or if necessary, just create them. And so we created an experiment. It just naturally fell out. So we went back to our teams. Actually, she didn't. We were in the Belgium office, so she just went upstairs. I came back to London. Three months later, we're back in the same coffee shop in Brussels. And I said, right, let's talk about it. She said, I'm doing it your way. <laughs> yeah. So the first problem is you don't really know what you're going to be doing in 10 weeks' time. So predicting what you're going to be doing, you know, shit happens, the world changes. And particularly, you know, the first and second months, you're going to be learning new things you could do. What i would found was that once you start to sideline the backlog, it kind of becomes irrelevant. We just get the team into a sprint planning meeting, we review where we are with the OKRs, we tick off what we've done, and then we say, right, the ones we're focusing on, what do we need to do? What do we need to get done? Now, it may be there's an item in the backlog that someone remembers is there and goes and fishes it out. The product owner may even have gone reviewing the backlog and found a suitable item beforehand. But, you know, we're going to close the OKRs at the end of the quarter, that old time boxing idea. So if necessary, we'll change what the ask is. We're trying to meet the objective. And we're finding this work. So, so here's my challenge to you. Thought experiment. When you go into the office on Monday, you go in and you find someone's thrown your backlog in the bin. Or you find that at last you have been hacked and your backlog was deleted. <laughs> or Prigozhin has hijacked your backlog and wants a million dollars to give you a back. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So this is, this is quite a common reaction. People open champagne, they kick back, they celebrate. <laughs> the, back, the backlog's become a real tyranny. It's a slave driver, isn't it? So after you sober up from your celebrations, what do you do next? Start building it again. Start building it again, the backlog again, or the whole thing? No, just the, the plan of what you want to do in the next few months. Right, and is that going to be difficult? No. Where, where's the plan if you've, if you've deleted it? Where's the plan? It was never on the backlog in the first place. Yeah, it was up here, wasn't it? it it's floating around. There's, there's, there's some artifacts, and also it's in your head. A any other suggestions? Any, any devs in the room? What are you going to do when you suddenly don't have a backlog item? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. You're literally going to stop. Yeah. Wonderful. I love you. <laughs> so, so, side story. This, this company was split between London and um, Brussels. Um, there was a point where me and the product owner deliberately starved the sprint backlog. We deliberately set it low, and we let the team run out of work. We want to reduce the whip levels. Sky can like, great, 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 reduce whip. Okay. So we deliberately engineered. Unfortunately, the day they ran out, neither me nor the product owner was available. <laughs> the team had a few hours not knowing what to do. That story spread around the company like wildflower fire. You know, people, I heard your team ran out of backlog items to do. <laughs> It was a black mark on both. We saw it was a great success. Because a lot of the stuff the team was doing, we didn't think was important. But, oh my god. Anyway, um, you tend to know what you were working on yesterday. You tend to know what's urgent. You tend to know about systems that are down. And if you don't, rebuilding the backlog is a wonderfully cathartic exercise. And you get to revalidate it. And there is actually, well, for starters, when, when I pose this question, I regularly get people, and there might be somebody in the room here who says, we do that. And anybody actually periodically flush your backlog? Yeah? 
There was somebody at the drinks last night, they say, yeah, we throw it away every month. And there's one company that has a practice that comes pretty close to this. And you might have heard of them. Um, they are called Amazon. <laughs> now, I think there might be one or two people in the room who, who have worked for Amazon, so you might want to tell me how, exactly how this works. But um, they have, or it's Bezos used to push this day one mentality. And the idea was every day is day one at Amazon. Every day, Amazon is a startup that's saying, duh, how do we survive? How do we make money? You know, and I, even the details differ. I like that mentality because it's saying, you know, no matter what we were doing yesterday, today we're prepared to look at what we're doing. And if the thing we're doing yesterday no longer makes sense, if the thing we we're building yesterday has just been launched by a competitor, if the thing we we're doing yesterday cost us a million dollars and today doesn't make sense, we'll throw it away. And you know, there's examples like the Amazon Fire Phone, which they just threw away. One could argue they never should have done it, but at one point, they were brave enough to discontinue it. Whether they actually do it every day, I don't know, you tell me. But they are prepared to say, let's revalidate everything. Let's think again. Let's not be beholden to what we said we'd do a few weeks ago or a couple of months ago. So even if you don't lose your backlog, imagine if you left your backlog in place. And on Monday, you just went and said, Let, let's go back to basics and rethink all of this. You know, and take this day one mentality. What is going to add benefit to our company? What is going to add value to our customers? And think about it. And Amazon's not the only example. Um, accountancy has a technique called zero-based budgeting. I don't know if any of you come across it. Apparently, it's hell to live through. It's a real bane for managers because they have to justify the entire budget rather than just rolling it over. So it's not necessarily pleasant, but it's a similar idea. Imagine we've got a clean sheet. Let's rebuild what our budget should be. And in fact, we have the same idea in our societies. We have, well, at least in this country at the moment, we have democratic elections. So sometime in the next 18 months, we're able to say, is the thing Rishi Sunak and his gang doing really good? Do we want to continue with Brexit, small boats, and reducing inflation? Or do we want to wipe the slate clean and allow somebody else to have a go at trying to do this. You know, we have examples in our world where we, like the projector does, we sometimes wipe things clean <laughs> and we reset. So this is what I'm suggesting you do, that you are prepared to reset things. And when you reset things, some things don't get reset. You work for organizations that have a purpose. Now, the language here gets confusing because there's purpose and there's goals and there's missions and there's BHAGs and there's massively transformable process. Two North, lots of people out there have ideas. So I'm going to call this a level one goal. Why does your company exist? How does your organization add value to society? Why should we tolerate your oil company drilling holes in the ground? You know, why does society accept your right to trade? And if you're Wagner, we don't accept that, OK? Uh, so most of your organizations exist for an overarching purpose. And generally, that does not change. And if it does change, it's a slow and difficult process. And there's very few organizations you can name, Nokia's one, that do change that overarching purpose. But you know, Glaxo's still in the business of drugs, whatever they call themselves. Um, Actually, who else have we got? Shell is still in the business of oil and energy. Those things don't tend to change. Companies have purpose. And within that purpose, they will have missions, what I'll call level two goals. Okay? I say, you know, pharmaceutical companies are a great example because they have drugs for Alzheimer's and drugs for cancer and drugs for headaches and drugs for COVID. You know, and they've got these different missions that they're pursuing simultaneously. Okay? And again, they have longevity. They don't tend to change. Or if they do, they, they, take, they run for years. And we do things within those missions to build towards our purpose. So there's always some context here. And what we're saying is, at a smaller level, and we default to quarter, as Jeff said this morning, although it could be 10 weeks, could be 16 weeks, whatever you like. You know, periodically, we set our level three goals. Now, I'm going to talk about doing that with OKRs. But if you're a fan of some other technique, uh, um, product goals, desired outcomes, um, yeah, jobs to be done. What, whatever technique you want to feed in, feed it in here. But every three months or so, be prepared 
to wipe out what you've done and say, starting afresh, let's rebuild what we need to do. Let's revalidate what customers want. And you know what? If you had it right in the first place, if your goals were the right goals, if your backlog was the right backlog, and you've been talking to your customers and they've been giving you the right answers, then when you revalidate it, you're going to get a list which is identical to the list you started with. You may have lost a little bit of time. Chances are you won't. So, yeah, think about it in those kind of terms. And so what you're building is a just-in-time story generator. Every three months, you're reloading your story generator. And once you've reloaded your story generator, every time you need to say, what should we do next? What feature should we build? What story should we do? You go back to your story generator. You've loaded it with whatever. You turn the handle on your story generator, and it spits out some stories for you to build. And so instead of having a backlog, inventory, you've got a machine that generates what you need just in time. Anyone heard this before? Doesn't this sound a bit like lean, you know? The way Ford and GM used to have these warehouses full of parts to use in the next few months, and Toyota just have a supplier truck turn up every day with the parts you need for the day. The same kind of idea. Lean, if you like, just in time story generator, and we can feed in whatever analysis technique you need to this. And then you crank up machine, and it spits out the stories, and you do them, and then you evaluate them, and you decide what to do next. So your sprints don't change much. Just instead of having a, a it really sucks my flow when it does that. <laughs> instead of having a back, instead of drawing cards from a backlog, you're writing out the cards as you go. And that's going to improve your conversation because it's an opportunity rather than some product only type person saying, here's one I prepared earlier for you with all the pre written acceptance criteria so we don't need to do that power of three thing. Yeah? You're saying, okay, we want to do something along these lines. What can we do? Let's talk about what we can do. Let's talk about what the acceptance criteria would be. Let's talk about whether we can do that within the sprint, within the three weeks. And instead of saying, all these items in the backlog, how long are they going to take? Now let's try and do a jigsaw puzzle of putting them all together so they just, just fill the time available. We're saying, OK, our sprint ends in two weeks, our quarter ends in three months. What can we do in the time we have? And if you can't do the thing you first thought of, you think of something else. Because for any problem, there are multiple solutions. And actually, those solutions change over time, depending on your knowledge, your experience, the available technologies, and the cost benefit. Um, so your sprints look much the same as they ever did. It's just your goal drives your planning. And you are constantly asking yourself, what do we need to do to advance against our goal? And I think, um, you know, thinking again about Jeff's presentation this morning, somebody was asking, what do I do with developers who aren't particularly engaged? Well, from my point of view, most of those developers are not engaged because you've taught them not to be engaged. Do the friggin' stories. <laughs> Only come back to me when you've done the work I've given you to do. Yeah, I think if we ask those people to be engaged in deciding what the work is and encouraging them to understand our customers and our goals, I think it's going to make them more motivated. Now, you may need to work at that a bit over time to engage them. But surely, in a world where maybe they're cutting less of the code and the machine is cutting the code, isn't the real power of the human in thinking about what needs to be done? And the more brain cells, the more eyeballs you can bring to that problem, the more powerful it's going to be. So your sprints don't change that much. Uh, and still measure your progress against the outcomes. Again, the word Jeff was using, outcomes. It's not about output, it's about outcomes. How have you changed the world? How have you changed the behaviors of people? And so you end up with this super cycle laying on top of your sprints. So you, you're going sprint, 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 sprint all the way through. And every so often, you come back to the beginning and you reset. So you could think of it as a super sprint. You know, you've just got set your new goals here. Do your sprint, do your sprint, do your sprint. Keep working towards the goals, keep working towards the goals, keep working. Oh, if you get to the end, you finish the sprint, you finish the cycle, breathe a sigh of relief. Yes, do a retrospective. 
and then set about creating your goals for the next quarter. You know, as Jeff said this morning, you speculate about what the roadmap after today should be. And I would expect that if you're in the, the product space, towards the tail end of this cycle, you're going to be thinking about that more. And towards this end of the cycle, you're going to be out visiting customers and examining the market more. But, you know, you've got a regular cycle. And um, you're building, in same with a sprint, you're building in checkpoints where you say, stop and consider what we're doing. Think about these things. So think broadly here, narrow, 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 narrow. Broadly here while you reevaluate, and broadly to reset. And as I said before, you're working in time boxes. The question is not how long will it take, but what can we do in the time we have available? I have a, an exercise I do in another context, and I put people into teams, and I put a story on screen that says, I want an online shop. And I say to the teams, you are competing. You're going to bid for this work. You are competing. Um, so I want you to go out, think about how long you want to bid, how long it'll take you to do this work, and how much you'll bid to do this work. And when you come back in, we're going to see who gets the contract. And I've got some more details. I hand out bits of paper to people with more, the story and more information on it. 20 minutes later, I bring the teams back in. And I say to the teams on the right, right um, team one, how long do you want? How much your cost? And I go through the teams. Without fail, they want about a million dollars. They want six months, they want a year. I think the record was like three million dollars and two years. Yeah? And the teams on the left, they're giggling. They're trying to keep a straight face while they're coming back. And I turn to them and say, how long do you want? Uh, we'd like $10,000 and we'll do it in two weeks. Or we want $5,000 and we'll do it this afternoon. And the team's on the right, like, what? <laughs> and then I fess up. The team's on the right have a store that's laced with big numbers. As a multinational corporation, I want an online store to sell my widgets to my multinational customers, cut out the middlemen. I've budgeted $1.2 million for this. I expect an EBIT in return, blah, 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 big numbers. And the team's on the left have a story that says, as an artisan widget maker, I want to give up my day job and make widgets full time. If I can sell these over the website and make $100,000, I can live my dream. My accountant tells me websites cost $5,000. All the teams have come up with valid solutions. The teams on the right have started from scratch. The teams on the left are probably going to say, we'll install WordPress, put Magento on it. Maybe they said, we'll set you up on Amazon Marketplace, we'll put you on Etsy. They're all viable solutions. And to be honest, if you're a digital agency, if you're a consultancy, and you know the client's got $1.2 million to spend, you're going to be irresponsible if you don't bid for it all and a bit more. <laughs> if, on the other hand, you know the client's got five or $10,000 to spend, you might not get our bed for it, or you're going to bid five or 10000 The estimation process is bollocks. You're going to construct a solution that fits within the constraints. This is called engineering. <laughs> if we know what the constraints are, we can come with a solution. And sometimes you might want to say to people, um, you know what, we, we can't build it for 10,000. You, you, you need to spend more. By the way, a little while ago, I added a third story to this mix. And one or two teams will get a slightly different story. It's the million dollar story, but it's got an extra rider at the bottom. And it says, we have been advised by MacArthur Consulting that we should take an agile approach to this work with an MVP. What do you think those teams bid? Come on, someone. You're told to build an MVP. Bid a lot less. A lot less? No, they're almost indistinguishable from the teams that bid a million, yeah? And sometimes they're even higher than the teams that bid a million. <laughs> and, and to be honest, that's just words, isn't it? If you know your client's got $1.2 million to spend, by all means, dress it up. Give them some slideware that tells them they'll be MVP. But you want the million dollars. <laughs> yeah, it makes no difference. But some advice to you, if you are trying to play in the MVP space, and I hate the term MVP, if you are trying to play that, 
then the next time you talk about MVP, make sure you reduce the numbers. Say, we've only got a month to deliver this, or we've only got £10,000 to spend on this. Yeah? You know, you know, the tale of two test and trace applications, you know, the Irish test and trace application was out for, well, months before the British one. The British one got wrapped up in red tape and subcontractors and all the rest of it. The, the Irish one and the German one were open source. Why the British government didn't just cancel our test and trace app and download the German one and translate it, I do not know. <laughs> so anyway, um, you work within the constraints, and time is one of those constraints. And it's a time box. You work to the time you have, not to the time you wish you had. Because we all know you can't estimate time. You're humans. You can't estimate time. But what you can do is work to deadlines. Yeah? So... What I want you to do is I want you to think about the goals. And I want you to lead the goals. Put those goals first and foremost. And your work you do should follow your goals. And your goals should align with any strategy you've got. And you focus on the goals and little else. If, if you've seen me speak before, or you've read some of my books and whatnot, you've probably heard me talk about no projects and some other ideas around. The common theme is here. Be really clear about what you're trying to achieve and don't let proxies get in the way. Don't let the project model, don't let Gantt charts, don't let estimation, don't let backlogs. Just, you know, keep putting the ultimate goal first and foremost. Don't lose sight of it. You know, stick it on the wall. Talk about it when you meet. By all means, you need to bring things down to a small manageable size. Little stories, little tasks, little stuff to do. But you need keep an eye on the overarching thing. Otherwise, you'll get an effect called goal displacement, where you'll be following the schedule. You'll be burning down the backlog. You'll be doing anything that is doable rather than trying to tackle the ultimate outcome you want to do. And one last little tip, because I know the question that always gets asked, by the way, and I'll take some questions in a few minutes. The question that always gets asked is, how do I actually do this? Because my boss isn't going to let me delete the backlog. <laughs> so you know what? Your boss don't know nothing. You can just quietly sideline the backlog, talk about the goal, make sure the goal's agreed, and then let your work follow the goal, and gradually the backlog will disappear. But what you could do right now is, every time somebody wants you to put an item in the backlog, write an expiry date on it. You know when you buy milk or meat or cheese at the supermarket, it's a use buy, best before buy. And you know not to bother. Just when you put something in a backlog, put an expiry date on it so that your backlog of a thousand items will start to expire. Because the thing that is a great idea today is probably still a great idea tomorrow. If it's still a great idea, gonna be a great idea next year. There's no real point in bothering doing it anytime soon because you've got all year to do it in. And if it's going to be a great idea for the next month, but in a month and a half it's worthless, then you want it to just go away. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, simplest viable change you could do, just start writing expiry dates on your backlog items. Okay? The other question that's really come up recently um, is about would I apply this to bugs? And the answer is yes. Because in my book, bugs is just a, a, another change request. We apply the word bug so we can point fingers. He did it wrong. <laughs> he should have known better. You know, so you can say, you know, it's a bug, so you have to fix it for free. You know, there is no bug fixing fairy. They don't fix themselves. It's always a choice between fixing a bug and doing something shiny. So I'll apply the same kind of thing into a bug. I'd rather you didn't have bugs, and we can talk about how you can not have bugs, that's another conversation. But once you get very few bugs, it becomes a very different kind of game. You can see clearly there's change requests. You know, so again, no point in having a bug backlog of a thousand bugs, and some of them date you know, back years. If they've not been important to do for the last two years, why are you likely to do them next week? Yeah? Um, so, right to expiry date, yes. Generally, I'm calling this whole kind of idea objective-driven agile, and hopefully I'll get to write something on it and expand on it more generally. But at the moment, it's a, a fluid set of ideas I'm playing with. Um, 
There you go. Goals over backlog, objective driven agile. There's my contact details. We've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much. This gentleman here had his hand up really quick and since I've been picking on him, he gets to go first. <laughs> um, yeah. So you said... I'll take that. Well done, by the way. Great uh, presentation. But uh, you said you should nuke your backlog every three months. Why the number three months? I'd rather you did it more often. Uh, for, like Jeff said this morning, organisations tend to be wired on si uh, quarterly cycles. And OKRs tend to work on quarterly cycles. <clears throat> so, one, that's what people do. Uh, I, I've heard arguments that you should do on a different cycle. And to what? I find the arguments pretty convincing. Because if your organisation is working on a cyclical basis, you're doing quarterly accounts, at the end of the quarter, everyone's really busy doing the accounts. If you've got quarterly sales targets, at the end of the quarter, you're doing quarterly reviews, performance reviews, you end up with a quarter which is packed full of events. And so I can see an argument for going a different frequency so that you aren't overloading those spots. Um, so I think we need a bit of experimentation around this. And it was interesting hearing Jeff speak this morning because all the OKR literature is quarter, 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 and then can I be high? We should say, but it doesn't have to be a quarter, really. And I think we just need a bit more experimentation to find what is. If you shrink it down, you do get to a point where it's a two-week sprint. And so I think it's worth having something bigger than a sprint, a bigger goal, a bigger thing to talk about. Because the thing is, I find you do want more senior leaders to at least comment on what your goals are. And sprint level, it's really efficient for us to work, but it's difficult to get high-level involvement because it's too small for them to get out of bed. So we do need something bigger to talk about. Makes sense. And one other quick one. Yeah. Why add an expiry date to uh, the backlog if you're just going to nuke it? I know, that was this minimal viable change. Please nuke your backlog. If you feel as if you can't nuke your backlog on Monday, at least on Monday, start writing expiry dates. And then at some time in the future, your problems should start to dissipate. Oh. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I am a Scrum Master. I've got a product owner, I've got developers, a classic setup, some may say. Um, my question to which may cause fires in here is, who, in your opinion, owns a backlog? <sighs> <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I'm near the door. Some things in this world <laughs> are so important. <laughs> some things are so important that they must be owned by a designated individual. And some things in this world are so important that they're owned by all of us. And I think backlog is kind of owned by all of us, but really the, the workings of the backlog tend to fall on the product owner for me. And I'm going to say product owner as it should be. Too often, Correct. product owners are junior product owners managers, or they are BAs who have got battlefield promotion to product owner. <laughs> and they, these people re report to product managers. Okay. Who are the most important people in your company? Who calls the shots ultimately in your company? Developers. Who's that? Developers. <laughs> it can feel like that, but... <laughs> Who's the most important people in the company? Stakeholder. Who are you working for? Stakeholders? Stakeholders, specifically the shareholders, the owners, the people who own your company. Managers are hired guns. I know what I'm speaking about here. I have an MBA. <laughs> Managers are hired guns, and a lot of business schools are obsessed with the agency problem of what happens when managers don't do what's in, in, in shareholders' interests. The shareholders, the owners are the most important people. Managers come and go. And that is the model that the title product owner is getting to. The product owner is really invested in that product. The product owner feels the product. They empathize with customers, right? 
And therefore, product managers are higher guns who should be reporting to product owners. Unfortunately, and probably because of banks, because banks are the only place in this world where managers take precedence over owners, and um, we've flipped the model around. And product owners are often these kind of lesser being backlog administrators. So I think the product owner, you know, they, they kind of own the backlog on behalf of the whole team and the whole organization. Okay. Slightly longer answer than you are probably hoping for. Well, I bet the correct answer, thank you. <laughs> We're kind of out of time, but we'll take you one last one. Yeah. Really oh, I'll be on the beach later. <laughs> Hopefully it's a really quick one. So uh, you talked about when someone gives you an idea or says something to yeah. add to your backlog, and it's much easier just to add it on and, and not do it. Do you think it's um, one of the things that, that sometimes we talk about, certainly within the product community, is, well, let's have a, a tool that lets us capture ideas, and then we can yeah. assess ideas and do all those sorts of things and add it to a future consideration or now, next, future. Is it right to say that actually taking that mindset is just a continuation of building an ever bigger backlog and it's better to nuke those sorts of things as well? Uh, so you're not the first person to ask that. Uh, I know, I know um, one product manager I know, he said for him the backlog's just a collection of tidbits he's picked up. And the question is, what's the expectation over that collection? Is, is that a collection of suggestions and nobody really, it's your database of thoughts that you can query, or are people expecting it in some way to be done? And I think if you can keep it in the good ideas pot, reference material, somebody once said, that's fine to collect them. The moment people start to have expectations around it, that's where you get into this. We end up with a list and we end up degrading trust. Yeah? So I'm trying to hedge my bets. Yeah. yeah great. Thank you so much. Have another round of applause.